next on the Bill Gephardt Show podcast. Most of us are making decisions based on the fact that we're just sick and tired of this and we want it to be over and damn it, we want our lives back to normal. And that's not, I mean, it's totally understandable. We all feel that way, but it's not rational. Even as infection rates rage, hopeful new signs in the war on COVID, but also words of caution from one of Utah's top epidemiological docs, Dr. Andrew Pavia from University of Utah Health and Primary Children's on why we need to keep our guard up as we enter a brand new phase. Today's podcast brought to you by these fine sponsors of local journalism, Reams Food Stores, where you can now order online and pick up curbside in Sandy and West Jordan. City Creek Mortgage, where Mortgage Mike says, expect to save money. The attorneys of Robert J. DeBryan Associates, when you're injured, your attorney matters. Steve's Automotive Specialists, hiring the best mechanics in the business and paying top wages to get them. ES Solar, Utah's premier solar electric contractor. Save money now with clean, safe solar power. All Utah Plumbing, Heating and Air, where owner John Holland and his rock solid team stand behind their white glove service with the best warranties in the business. And Stoffer's Towing, you know when you need a tow, you can request Stoffer's Towing. Dr. Pavia, thank you for joining us. Now, we've talked to you at every major turn on the road in this fight against COVID, and here we are again. You've been right. You warned us about the Delta variant and about Omicron. You were spot on. You said the unvaccinated would be at the greatest risk for serious illness, hospitalization, and death, and you were absolutely right on that prediction. You were also said how hospitals would be overrun. We all see the hospitals overrun, not just in Utah, but elsewhere right now. And so now we find ourselves at another turning point, one that hearkens to a brighter day, maybe, one where Omicron maybe goes away and COVID-19 is on its way to no longer being a threat, the threat that it was or is. So where are we really? Is it time to rip off the masks and crowd into the enclosed space like it's happening in sort of in lots of states? Or is there, what, what, is, the, what is the story right now as you see it? Yeah. You know, everyone wants a simple answer, Bill. I want us to predict the future. And we've not been very good at doing that. And I think we're at a point which, you know, there's some good news, but the future is a little bit cloudy on the longer term. Uh, the numbers of cases are coming down. Part of that, though, is from undercounting because we're doing less testing and people are able to test at home. Uh, and um, so if you look at test positivity, which is a uh, not so much affected by who gets tested, it's coming down too. But it's it's still really high. We're still at numbers that last January would have curdled our blood. Yes. The good news is everything points to continuing to go down, but we're, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. Somebody once said uh, that it's a little bit like um, you get pulled over for a cop and he says, uh, Bill, you're going 85. And you tell the cop, yeah, but I was going 110 yesterday. So, um, so we, we <laughs> well are headed in a good direction, but we're not out of the woods and people need to realize that. The other thing that, you know, and I hate to be a prophet of doom and gloom here, but this virus is very, um, very malleable and has been very unpredictable. So I, we're not done with it. I think we're done with this winter Omicron surge or we're not done with it. We will be done with it in a matter of weeks and it's okay. going to get better, but there's going to be another chapter. And I hope that chapter will be milder. I hope that won't happen until next winter or sometime soon so that we have a good reprieve and can start to do some recovery. But any prediction we make um, really is, <laughs> is saying we don't know what we're talking about if we make a clear cut prediction. So what should you do today? Um, I think we still have a week or two or three of, of needing to be a little bit careful until the numbers get down to what we would have considered reasonable numbers last year. So test positivity of seven, eight percent would be really good. And we'll get there. Um, until then, I think you have to be careful. Um, I think one of the most important things I worry about is if we don't want to have this happen again, we've got to do a better job of getting people vaccinated. Uh, we now know that the two-dose series isn't really good enough. It's really a three-dose series that it takes to protect everyone. And although we're doing okay with everyone getting two doses, about 62% of Utahns are vaccinated, only about a quarter have had that third dose. So we've got to do better on both 
of those fronts. And then we've got to get a vaccine out for our youngest kids. That's really, really important. And that has been a holdup just now where Pfizer, which I'm sure you know about that, uh, Pfizer has suspended the distribution now for more testing for children under seven. Is that what it is? No. So it's a sort of unusual study. So uh, a story, Pfizer um, was working towards getting the information on a three dose series for kids uh, under four and under because two doses didn't seem to work too well for the three and four year olds, although it did work for the smaller children. At FDA's urging, they were asked to submit the data before they had all the data in and to get approval for starting the first two doses so that we could go ahead and offer vaccine to parents while waiting to see the third dose data. Uh, They made the decision, which I actually think is a good one, uh, although it's really frustrating to parents and it's frustrating to pediatricians, they made the decision to wait another month or so till they really had the data to to know that three doses worked. Uh, I think we already know it's gonna be safe in this age group, but making decisions without really having the information in front of us you know, it, it, it's not a good message. It suggests that we're really jumping the gun. And with Omicron on the way down, there isn't quite the urgency to get young kids vaccinated that there was in December or January. Um, but, you know, I, I really want those younger kids to be vaccinated before the next surge. We will be back in just a moment with Dr. Andrew Pavia to talk about the future of this virus. You fought. You've protected You've struggled. You've persevered. You've worked tirelessly during this pandemic. When you were overwhelmed, you endured. Many of us haven't made it, but so many more of us have. For watching over our family, our friends, our loved ones, we thank you. Today's podcast brought to you by these fine sponsors of local journalism. Reams Food Store is where you can now order online and pick up curbside in Sandy and West Jordan. City Creek Mortgage, where Mortgage Mike says, expect to save money. The attorneys of Robert J. DeBryan Associates. When you're injured, your attorney matters. Steve's Automotive Specialists, hiring the best mechanics in the business and paying top wages to get them. ES Solar, Utah's premier solar electric contractor. Save money now with clean, safe solar power. All Utah Plumbing, Heating and Air, where owner John Holland and his rock solid team stand behind their white glove service with the best warranties in the business. And Stoffer's Towing, you know when you need a tow, you can request Stoffer's Towing. We are now talking again with Dr. Andrew Pavia, uh, who is uh, the state's, I don't know if he would agree to this, but it's my opinion, top epidemiologist and been studying this for a long time. Um, Tell me a little bit about science and and, and predictions, because, you know, in, in my experience with science has been scientists sit around all day and try to prove each other wrong. And I mean that literally and figuratively. They, um, they, science is 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 determined, and then somebody comes up with something new through experimentation, and we have to change our views. Uh, I have a feeling you're a little worried about the credibility of science. I certainly am not because I've seen this all my life. And, and so, as we make predictions, what should people expect as science makes predictions? Yeah. So I, I think even people who liked science in high school and did well in it, understand that science is an ongoing process. We, we, we figure out what we know, but we're always challenging ourselves and our colleagues are challenging us to see if it is still holding or what we're going to learn going forward. And we're always learning more. That's led to a lot of confusion, things that we've had to change what we knew as we learn more about this evolving virus. And there's some areas where we've not done so well. One of them has been predicting what's going to come next. We knew from early on that variants could occur, uh, but we didn't do a very good job of guessing when they would occur and even what they would look like. Now, I think most of us really didn't want to be in a, in a position of guessing. We wanted to prepare for all the possibilities. Yes. Um, and we also, to be um, 
honest, we used old models of how infectious diseases behaved that were based on other viruses. So we use mathematical models derived from things like measles to predict where we might be a couple months out. And those didn't models, didn't, and those models didn't, didn't quite work. Oh, so okay. we were wrong a bunch of times, you know, when, both wrong in thinking that things were going to get progressively worse. There were some really bad predictions uh, for the uh, fall of 2020, for example, that didn't come to pass. But we're also really wrong in predicting that things were going to go away. Remember back to May of this year when, you know, we were all burning our masks and celebrating the end. And since then, we've had two devastating waves that were worse than the initial bad wave in uh, December, January of 2020. The fact of the matter is viruses evolve. They change. Uh, there is a, a school of thought that says a virus will not will evolve so it does not kill its host, host being, in this case, human beings. Um, Omicron did that. Omicron became more virulent, but it also became less deadly. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a virologist. But as you make predictions toward next winter, what do you personally think is going to happen? Do you think we're going to, because right now the hospitals are still packed. They may be less packed across the country soon. Are we going and the death rate is coming down. The infection rate, I think, is steady. What do you think is going to happen, just personally speaking, next winter? There are a couple of things that we have a certain amount of confidence about. We're going to have more antivirals. We're going to have more monoclonal antibodies. We're going to be better at treating people who get sick. Um, we're going to have a fair amount of immunity in the population that's going to reduce the severity through vaccine and previous infection. But you know, one thing we're learning is that immunity doesn't last. It certainly doesn't last from previous infection, but it also is not permanent from the vaccines that we have now. So we will have some things that would suggest that any surge that occurs next winter might be less bad. Okay. Uh, but we also know that the virus can change to evade our immunity as happened with Omicron. It can change to partially evade the protection of vaccines, which is what Omicron did. And we can certainly imagine a variant that would emerge that would have much more uh, escape from vaccine immunity that would make things much worse. Now that doesn't have to happen. As you say, um, the virus is only gonna do whatever makes it survive. It's whatever, whatever gives it an advantage. So if that advantage is to be more easily transmissible and worse for us, more virulent, cause more deaths, it'll do that. If the advantage comes from being more transmissible, but having more people still feeling good and walking around, not going to work and coughing on other people, yeah. that will be the preferred pathway that evolution takes. Quite honestly, I am a guy who would wear a mask, a guy who listens to science, a guy who has had two vaccines plus the booster and looking forward to the next booster that I think is coming down the pike for somebody like me and maybe for all the rest of us, I'm still confused because we hear that New York state says, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're, we're opening things up. We're, we've got some vaccinations. We hear Utah is pretty much already sort of opened up. Uh, on the other hand, we see at schools, they're wearing people as kids are still wearing masks. The, our governor in Utah, uh, a couple of weeks ago said, let's let all state employees go substitute for teachers who are sick. Oh, the teachers are sick so that we have to do that. Well, that's not a, that's not very good news. But then, so all these uh, state employees and whatever they do, get, get to come in and substitute teach. And we see the governor on, on, on tape not wearing a mask. And we see the principals and superintendents and kids wearing a mask. And I don't know what to do. I'm, I, I don't, the, mis, the messaging for me is, is, I know what I am doing, but I don't know what I should be doing. I, the, the messaging is so mixed from medical leaders and political leaders. And can you help me with that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that the messaging from medical leaders has been as mixed as you make it out to be. But, you know, politics has played a huge part in it. I think what we always are doing is trying to titrate our own risk and our own risk tolerance. 
So you and I are probably of an age where we're at increased risk, even with the vaccines. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about that when we make decisions about whether or not we're going to wear a mask in a crowded indoor place. If you've had three doses of vaccine and you're 25 years old and you're deciding about something that's really important to you, like going to your uh, friend's wedding, you might make a different decision about wearing a mask. We're, we're entering a point at which you should be making rational decisions based on your own risk and your own risk tolerance. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening. Most of us are making decisions based on the fact that we're just sick and tired of this and we want it to be over and damn it, we want our lives back to normal. And that's not, I mean, it's totally understandable. We all feel that way but it's not rational. It's not the best way to make decisions. And certainly I think a lot of our political leaders are really demonstrating that same sense. If I say it's over, if I want it to be over, uh, well, by God, let's act as if it's over. But it's not. It's, you know, listen, when this Omicron, when, when the Delta virus took over or became, you know, what, what, as, as awful as it was in creating the sickness and death that it was creating, and we were starting to open things up, as I recall back then. And I remember how this got started. This was one person in Northern California and maybe another person in Washington state who seemed to have this, what they call Delta 19 or Delta Omega, the virus. And that was two. And when we opened it up, we had millions who still had the virus. We have millions now who have the virus and we're opening things up. And it, it doesn't make sense to me that there's just a disconnect there for me. Yeah. We tend to do things all in or all out, right? And, you know, I think there is a time, there are things right now or in the next couple of weeks that we should be starting to relax. But that's very different than saying it's all over. Let's get rid of all mask use indoors. Let's get rid of masks for school kids. Um, because, you know, that absolute response is not the same as saying, there's some things we can start to do again. In a couple of weeks, there'll be more that we can do. And by April, we're going to be able to do a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, I wish we weren't seeing the world as black and white, you know, shut down versus do nothing. That's a science way, though, isn't it? No, the science way is, is to, you know, evaluate risk, uh, figure out okay. what measures we have that work, what they're going to cost, you know, how, how much bang for the buck are we going to get by doing something? Shutting down all business cost a lot and didn't get us a whole lot of benefit, but wearing masks in school cost nothing and was enormously protective for kids. So those are the kinds of decisions that science drives us to make. Okay. Dr. Andrew Pavia, thanks so much for joining us. You're always very helpful. I'll see what you're doing in a month or so to, uh, to, to, uh, to see if anything has changed, okay? Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. And Thank you. stay safe. And there is good news out there. You know, it's just not, it's not as good as some people would portray it, but we are headed in a much better direction. Thank you, doctor. That is all for this podcast. For the latest in local breaking news 24-7, go to gepardaily.com. See you next time. 